All right, well, good evening. All right. You guys ready to do some more Ecclesiastes? <laughs> We're going to be in, uh, this, is, this is lesson number 11. This is lesson number 11. We're in Ecclesiastes 9 tonight. And uh, kind of for structure, you know, we're still talking about the limitations on, on what God's wisdom can do in this life of vanity. Now we're going to talk about how futile it is to live a life that doesn't have time to so. live. And uh, just so you can kind of track on where we're at uh, in the whole study, you know, I told you this is a chiasm, the way I was using the structure. The big message is fear God. And now we're, we've turned the corner and we're headed toward the conclusion. And so right now we're in this wisdom failure section again, where he, this is all repeated from the first. You know, he said, why is it repetitive? Well, it's repetitive by design. So last week we talked about how impossible it was to understand God's providence and how he works. You're going to get another dose of that tonight, by the way. Um, but tonight we're going to talk about the futility of trying to live without balance in life. Next week we're going to talk about, so this was about the futility of trying to control your life. This is the, the futility of, try, of not being in balance in your life. And next week we're going to talk about living with uncertainty. And, and uh, he's going to get, he's getting more practical, right? As he's, Turn the corner now, he's, you're going to see more Proverbs tonight, you're going to see more Proverbs next week, and then we're going to talk again about the brevity of time, and then we'll, we'll conclude. So, we're number 11, we end at number 15 on May 1st. So, we're on the home stretch here. Okay. Any questions about the structure, where we're at, what we're talking about? Okay, all right, well, let's pray tonight. Gracious Lord, we thank you again for your great and mighty word. Thank you that your word is alive and active. Thank you that your Holy Spirit uses your word to convict us, to teach us, to reprove us, to teach us obedience. Help us to hear your word tonight. We pray, Father, that you'd help us to see if there's futility. If we're living in futility as far as balance in our lives tonight. We thank you that you are God who helps us to have balance and help us to enjoy this life you've given us. We give you praise now for your great and mighty word. Amen. All right. So, um, can you work too much? Can you play too much? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yep. Yes. Okay. All right. So, I, and, and when you've got a, a, a world, right, that's kind of trying to spin faster and faster, right? We've got all this communication technology and everything. How do you keep balance? I know when I started work, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, you know, there, was no, there was no email. There were no cell phones. The first cell phone showed up in the late 80s, early 90s, you know, they were about the size of a brick, you know, I had, had to carry that thing around all the time when I was on call. And, uh, you know, we didn't have any of that stuff when I first started. But as the communication ran, you know, got easier and easier, the expectations that you were available came with it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, at least in a lot of my career, you know, it was basically you're on 24-7. It didn't matter where you were and what you were doing, you need to be reachable, you need to be part of the action. And emails kept flying and you know, and so you're up all night doing that. So I'm just saying that, that life seems to be spinning faster and faster. So how do you keep balance? That's kind of what we're after tonight. I called this, um, are the rats winning? Uh, you know, life in the rat race. <laughs> And, and that's kind of the question tonight is, are, the, are you keeping balance in your life tonight? And so this, this second section here, uh, of, of here is talking about God's wisdom. Think about the Proverbs and the teachings, the wisdom part of, of Scripture. Um, it's limited. We've talked about how it doesn't let us see beyond death or, or, or in some of these kinds of things. But tonight we're going to talk about how it's valuable to help us keep balance. 
it helps us keep balance. And we're also going to talk about um, getting wise counsel, listening to wise counsel. That's going to be one of the themes tonight. And the limitations of wise counsel. Why does wise counsel, why do people not listen to wise counsel? Why do people um, disregard wise counsel? We're going to talk about some of that tonight. And he's going to use some parables uh, to, to, to bring these issues up for us tonight. Well, let's read about life in the rat race. And it's going to sound a lot like what he talked about last week. So, so there's some, re you know, we're going to revisit some of these things. But he's also going to throw some nuggets in there that, are, that he actually makes a couple of astounding statements that we need to talk about tonight. So let's read here. Uh, I'm going to read 1 through 9, 1 through 6. And then I'm going to jump over and read 11 through 13. We're going to skip a section. We'll come back to it at the end. So let's, let's listen to what life in the rat race sounds like. Ecclesiastes 9.1, For I have taken all this to my heart and explain it that righteous men, wise men, their deeds are in the hand of God. Remember last week he talked about the sovereignty of God's providence and we can't, we can't uh, you know, steer our lives, that God steers our lives. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. It's the same for all. There's one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good and for the clean, for the unclean, for the man who offers sacrifice and for the one who does not sacrifice. As the good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. This is an evil that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil, and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. For whoever is joined with the living, there is hope. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Indeed, their love, their hate, and their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. Now I'm going to skip to uh, 11. Okay, I saw it again under the sun. Remember, he's always talking about what he sees, what he sees. I saw again under the sun that the race is not to the swift, the battle's not to the warriors, neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability, for time and chance overtake them all. Moreover, man does not know his time. Like fish caught in a treacherous net, and birds trapped in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. Also this I came to see as wisdom under the sun, and it impressed me. Okay, so he's, he's covered a lot of thoughts here tonight. So what are some themes that are in the book that we keep going over and over again that come out again in this passage tonight? <clears throat> Life is short. Death is certain for all men. We can't, God's sovereign, but we can't, we, we can't, um, steer and, and control a lot, right? He's, he's hitting all those again. Um, so he starts right off and saying it's the same for every man. Doesn't matter whether you go to church, whether you don't go to church. Doesn't matter whether you're clean, whether you're unclean, you're going to die. That's what he's saying in verse 2. Uh, but catch that, catch that statement he makes at the end of verse 1. Um, of nine or eleven? Uh, nine verse one. one. Nine verse one. He's, he said, you know, he says he's he's picking up what we talked about last week. And he's talking about righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. God's sovereignty over over the directions of our life. <clears throat> but catch that next one. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. Is God good or is he not good? He is good. <laughs> Some of the times the things he takes us through causes us to wonder though, right? That he's, it, um, 
Uh, so you can ask, is God for us or against us? And what he's saying here is God's not going to be limited by our convenience in how he steers our life. Think about Job, right? He's, he's brought Job up a couple times as we've gone through the book. Did, were things convenient for Job? Oh, no. Put him through the ringer. Yeah. God put him through the ringer. So in God's sovereignty, he's not limited by our convenience. Or by our, our um, expectations. Expectations, right? So that's what he's saying. If we don't know exactly where God's going to take us, is it love or is it hate? We don't know exactly how hard God might make our life at a certain point. But that's part of his sovereignty. <clears throat> um, we talked about verse 2, which is, you know, again, death is certain for everybody, um, regardless of whether you go to you know, whether you sacrifice or whether you, you're not, whether you go to church or not. Um, but look at verse 3. Now, this is an astounding verse. It, it, I'll just shake you. This is, there's, this is an evil in the, that is done under the sun, that there is no one faint for all men. Furthermore, it says, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil, and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterward, they go to the dead. Look at that statement about the hearts of men. Where have you seen that before in Scripture? The heart is deceitful. Heart is deceitful and wicked. And wicked. Who, can know it? Who can know it? I'm, 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 I'm going to take you back to Genesis. Anywhere in Genesis that this strikes you about. Look at Genesis 6, 5. The situation right before Noah. The situation right before Noah in Genesis 6 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. That sounds a lot like what the preacher just told us. And if I if you know, I think I'm being fair in saying that in this vain, absurd world, the heart of man left to itself now is just as evil as it would have been before Noah's time. Why did, why did Noah have to build a boat? Because of the wickedness of, of the population of the earth. So think, of, think about our day Right, and the vanity and the absurdity we talked about, and all this rebellion that's going on. Uh, you know, he, he says, you know, the ultimate the ultimate vanity is man's rebellion against God in all these different ways. And he's saying that the hearts of men in our day are just as evil as they were before Noah. That's a that's an astounding statement, and it, it basically means. It, it, Gives you some idea of the depths of evil men can take themselves to, right? This is an astounding statement, I thought. So we can, if you think it's, it's been, we can refer back to Noah and warning the people and all, and then all of a sudden they all went in Judgment. and the door was closed. Judgment. And they could bam on the door all they wanted to or whatever, but it was over. And that's the same way it is now. And we may be in the twilight of God's favor. And um, it, that's the way it's going to be. But the, van the, yeah, the vanity of this world, the absurdity of this world, uh -huh. of, the, of the same degree as it was before Noah. Yeah. That's it's all Eve's fault. Well, <laughs> God didn't... God didn't call it that way. Yeah, no. they, both, they both ended up being accountants. Yeah, okay. But, but that, that tells you the depths of the absurdity and the vanity that, that we're living within, right? But it also showed Noah. The thing about Noah, how many years did he build the boat? 120. That's his patience and grace and mercy. Well, just extend let us go to our own way uh, and that's how long god waited 
for people to change. God's, God's mercy in his God's providence. Right. Because I always wonder, why does he just step in right now in these horrible things that are happening mm -hmm. and just take care of it? Right, right. And that's, what, that's what we talked about last week. God's a noble providence. Why does he wait to bring judgment? Yeah. <laughs> but it also reminds us of God's patience and his grace again in our times just as much as in Noah's time. He's, he's, not, he's, he's gonna, not willing for any to perish. Yes. He's going to go to the extreme extent, mm -hmm. even to send his son to the cross, to, to prevent people from being under that judgment. But it's an astounding statement that that's the, that's the degree of, of the wickedness and the vanity of, of, of the world. All right, but verse 4, there's hope here. Verse 4, for whoever is joined with the living, there's hope. Surely a live, you don't like these proverbs, a live dog is better than a dead lion. Right? So, so what he's saying is while you're alive, there's still hope. There's still the opportunity to repent of evil. In other words, take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. And tonight, if there's, if there's anybody here, you doubt your salvation or, or you have not repented and trusted Christ, let today be the day. Well, that's what verse 4 is saying here. Let today be the day. God's, God's just as gracious now as he was in the days of Noah. Okay, so... Uh, Verse, verse 5 and 6, he's telling us the same thing we've heard before. Uh, he's talking about, you know, once you die, nobody remembers you anymore. You don't have a say in anything. Um, talks about their love, their hate, and their zeal have already perished. They no longer have a share in all that's done under the sun. Um, Hebrews 9.27, familiar verse. For it's appointed once for man to die, and after, the and after that, the judgment. So he's saying the same thing. Once you die, there's no do-overs. He's saying the same thing. So this tells you you need to live your life wisely in the time that you do have because you don't know about tomorrow. But there's no do-overs is what he's saying here. So you've got to live your life knowing that, you know, we're, we're, we're playing for real here. Every you know, We talked about the two-minute warning last week that we're playing the game for real because we don't know how much time's left in the game. All right, so all that, this is, this is life in the rat race. You know, I mean, this is why it's a rat race because of this, this sinfulness and you know, evil in our world. Um, also, as we jump over, go back to verse 11 now. I saw under the sun, isn't this amazing? The race is not to the swift. Think about what he's saying. And the battle's not to the warriors. Neither is the bread to the wise, nor the wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability. For time and chance overtake them all. Who's supposed to win the race? Fastest. The fastest one. But he's saying it doesn't always work that way. Who's supposed to, to um, I don't know, win, win the fight, Right. The meanest and the toughest guy in the ring, right? He says it doesn't always work that way. Who's supposed to, to um, uh, I'll just say, uh, you know, get ahead in in, uh, in their career? Well, the hardest working and the smartest, and uh, it doesn't work that way. That's what he's saying here. But yet, this is isn't this what our society tells us or tries to tell us? That you can be you can be all you want to be if you just work harder and you you know if you just put more into your job and and et cetera, et cetera. And it doesn't work that way. And that's what he's talking about, the vanity of the rat race. The faster you run doesn't mean you, that you win the race. So you get to the cheese before the other guy, the other rat, so to speak. <laughs> that the that you can't these things aren't predictable. And you know. We think you you see an athlete and he thinks he's the fastest, but that's always going to come somebody that's faster. Mm -hmm. You think you've got all this money? There's always going to be someone with more money. So it's never attainable in that way because there's always going to be someone that is faster, quicker, smarter, smarter. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. 
So that's what I said. The, the values prized by the world in human reason don't always lead to success. So the rat race, again, think about our society. The harder you work, the more hours you put in, the more education you get, the faster you run the rat race, doesn't guarantee that you're going to get the outcomes that you were trying to get. Right? And that's a shocker. And it's something, you know, most of us, at least for me, you had to be kind of you know, getting into your 40s before you kind of figured this out. But this, this uh, doing it all right, so to speak, it doesn't always work. Right? But all, all of our society, our culture is screaming in the ears, particularly I think of our kids and our grandkids, is screaming us in, the, in their ears, you know, if you just work harder and try harder and get smarter and hustle more, uh, you're going to get the cheese. And the preacher's saying, it doesn't work that way in this broken, vain world. Um, verse 7, I wanted to take you to Psalm 76. It says it a little different way. So Psalm 76, I'll, I'll start in, uh, make sure I'm in the right place here. I don't think I got in the right place. I think I, I didn't get the quote right. But it basically says that God's the one who raises up and puts down. It's not, it's not our own efforts or supposed merit or education or whatever. It's, I, I apologize, I got the wrong uh, reference here. But God has sovereignty over that. Uh, and it's not necessarily of our own doing. So what appear, appear to be uh, circumstances and randomness are factors of life. Look at 11 and 12 again. You know, even though you try to run the, the rat race as fast as you can, or be as strong as you can, or whatever, the time and chance overtake them all. In verse 12, moreover, man does not know his time. So you were like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare. So the sons of man are ensnared in an evil time when it suddenly falls on them. You don't know when, you know, um, you know, uh, something happened outside of your control. So even the harder the harder you work and the faster you run, there's things outside your control that you, you know, can set you back. And has that ever happened to you? I see some heads nodding. Any examples you want to share? Well, I'll throw one out. You know, you're doing you're doing real well, do, you know, everything, and then your company gets bought. And when they put the two companies together, they don't need you. That's right. Poof. You, you didn't get to control that. You were doing everything as well as you know how to do. Poof. And you had no control over that. Any other examples come to mind? You get hurt. You're an athlete. You get hurt. Yeah. Right? Poof. Right? So... This, this rat race again, it's, it's taking us back to the kind of the same ideas that he talked about last week in uh, chapter 8, verse 17. And I saw every work of God and concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not discover it. And though a wise man will say, I know, he can't discover it. So he's, he's saying again, he's reiterating his point. Faster, you, you, you can run the rat race. You can run as fast as you can. But there's still this unpredictability and unknowable providence of God uh, that you can't, you, you know, you can't control and you can't predict how God's going to act in your life, right? That's, that's what he's saying. You can't control that and you can't predict that because God in his sovereignty uh, takes his actions. So if you're the rat running the rat race, trying to get to the cheese, you just got to know you don't have complete control over everything. And even though you may be the fastest rat in the race, that doesn't mean you're going to win. So it kind of sobers us up then. 
All right. So let, let's talk about wisdom now. So in the rat race, let's talk about wisdom. Uh, I'm going to start in 9.13. And he's going to tell this, this story here. Also, this I came to see. So he's always seeing these things. I came to see his wisdom on the sun and impressed me. There was a small city with a few men in it. And a great king came to it and surrounded it and constructed large seed works against it. So they were trapped. The city, they were trapped and these people were waging war against them. Verse 15, but there was found in it a poor wise man and he delivered the city by his wisdom. Yet no one remembered that poor man. So I said, wisdom is better than strength. But the wisdom of the poor man is despised, and his words are not heeded. The words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. So he tells his story here. So who is the wise man? Who had the wisdom in, in the city that was trapped? Calls him a poor wise man. In the, in the Proverbs, wisdom is usually associated with wealth, health, and life. Okay, So in this case, what he's saying is the wisdom is coming from a very unexpected source. The wise man in the crowd was not the wealthy man. And that kind of implies also he was probably uneducated. So the, the wisdom being spoken in this situation is coming from a very unlikely source. Now, what was the outcome of, of the wisdom? When this guy spoke up, what happened? No one that somehow they got out of the, the mess that they were in. Okay. But then what, did anybody remember the wise man? Right? Have you ever spoken up and said you ought to consider this or that, and it worked out. And did anybody come back and thank you and shower you with praise and gifts or anything? Right? Right. You've, it's like so, it's like he's been saying all along. None none of the good deeds are remembered. Right. Life moves on, and, and the, well, it was the same way for this poor wise man. So it says he's actually despised, and his words are not heeded. So the words of the wise men, of, of the wise heard in quietness, are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. There's a proverb for it, right? The two pictures. The wise man talking in quietness versus the ruler shouting to fools, right? Very, very graphic depiction here. So um, again, I'm going to flip back to Proverbs 21, 22. The point he's making here, wisdom doesn't always come from the most obvious places. It can come from very unexpected uh, places. Proverbs 21, 22 says, he's, he's, he's actually kind of referring to this proverb here with his story. A wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the strongholds in which they trust. So God's wisdom gives you strength to, to deal with situations at this point. But it doesn't always come, is what the preacher's saying. It isn't always going to come from the people you'd expect it to come from. Right? We look, we look to people that have lots of degrees, or people that have lots of experience, or people who are touted um, for whatever reason in the, in the media, whatever. But that doesn't mean they're the wisest one in the room, even though they may think they are a lot of times, right? But, but so the preacher saying wisdom to keep balance in life may come to you from people you don't expect. You may, there may be sources of wise counsel that you wouldn't immediately look to here. And <coughs> wisdom, uh, wisdom is rare and valuable. It may come from unlikely sources, but it's often ignored in this noisy, insane rat race. So that's what verse 17 is about. Words of the wise heard in quietness are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Don't you love those? I just love the Proverbs. They're so graphic. We've got plenty of people who will, who will scream in a crowd and say all kinds of stuff. 
uh, but there's how many people do you know that you can get a, a, along with who in quietness will speak wisdom to you? How rare and valuable are these kinds of counselors, right? So that's that's one of the, the tricks or uh, tricks. The keys here, uh, we're talking about God's using God's wisdom heard in quietness. Um, uh, think about Proverbs three five to six. You've heard this one a lot before. The guy shouting to the crowd is pretty oftentimes is saying what the crowd wants to hear. Right? And they all hoorah, hoorah, hoorah. But a lot of times the wisdom we get in quietness and in private is things we don't want to hear. Uh, so trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. Right? Isn't that valuable counsel? Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got somebody who'll tell you what you don't necessarily want to hear. So, and also look at the fragility here, how fragile wisdom here is. The wise man, he was a poor guy, so immediately the, the higher echelon is probably not going to associate much with him. And it says he was despised. Wisdom is, is a fragile thing. And, and very often, not only is it not rewarded, it's actually despised. Uh, think about Rehoboam, the story of Rehoboam. Remember, put, you're looking at this through the eyes, if you will, of Solomon. 1 Kings 12 is the story of uh, Rehoboam. And you remember Rehoboam, he sought two kinds of counselors. He's, he's uh, ascending to the throne after Solomon has died. Uh, 1 Kings 12, it actually runs 1 through 15. Um, he has two kinds of counselors. Uh, verse 3, and they sent and called him, and Rehoboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke hard, therefore lighten the hard service of your father, his heavy yoke, and his heavy yoke that he put on, and we will serve you. So he hears this request from the people, lighten up on us, because he, he was basically, Solomon was basically using them almost like slave labor. And uh, so verse 6, And King Rehoboam consulted with the elders who had served his father Solomon while he was still alive. How would you counsel me to answer the people? And they spoke to him, If you will be a servant to this people today, we'll serve them, grant their, them their petition, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants. Verse 8, But he forsook the counsel of the elders which they had given him, and consulted with the young men who grew up with him and served him. And so he said to them, what counsel would you give me that we may answer this people? Uh, in verse 10, and the young men who grew up with him spoke to him saying, thus you shall say to this people who spoke to you, your father made our yoke heavy. Now I will make it, uh, now make it lighter, but I will shall speak to them. My little finger is thicker than my father's loins. Whereas my father loaded you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. Well, you know how well that went over. Mm -hmm. So the ten tribes basically said, we've had enough of you. We're breaking off. And this is when the kingdom splits. Mm -hmm. But so this is kind of what the preacher's talking about here tonight, that wise counsel, like the, the, the first group gave Rehoboam, it wasn't what he wanted to hear. It wasn't what he wanted to hear, he did, and he didn't get, and it wasn't in line with the approval of his running buddies either, right? So a lot of times this wise counsel is is advantageous, but it's fragile. It's not, and it's not easy. So so to live in balance, you're going to be swimming against the rat race, right? You're going to be swimming against the rat race. So you're going to be God's word's going to call you to do things that are different than the culture. To live different than the culture. But that's fragile and it's often not heeded and not welcome. 
So that's some, some words about wisdom. Any thoughts on that? Have you ever had anybody pull you aside along the way and say, you know, um, let me give you a, a suggestion or a word of advice that you remember? Are there any of those that are memorable to you? Somebody gave you good counsel? Yeah, I I had a problem with, this was, I was much younger, but I had a problem with a neighbor that I could not understand. And so I had some good friends that I trusted and I, I shared with them my problem and what would you tell me? And they said, can we pray about it? And so they came back to me with um, Psalm 37, 37, I think it was. And it turned out that that passage not only applied to that, but just so my heart helped me understand how this world is working. And it was very wise counsel. And it's that particular Bible, it's all smeared that section mm -hmm. because it really did resound. Mm -hmm. And I was, when you were talking about working and, um, you know, to get ahead and doing everything, it reminded me of this verse, and I just looked it up, and it's um, Colossians 3, 23, 24. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. So you're not going to get the reward from men probably, but you will from the Lord. Yeah, and the certainty of it versus yeah, that, the unpredictability yeah. of, of the world for that race. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's good. Anybody else? Sometime somebody gave you wise counsel? My mother was always giving me wise counsel. And I just didn't miss it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Poor, the poor wise men went unheeded. Occasionally I listened, but the majority of the time I didn't believe it. I mean, I believed it, of course. I just didn't listen and follow the wise. Okay. That's well, growing up. Well, let me ask you the other, like Rhea Bowen, did anybody ever give you poor counsel? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can think of a couple times. Yeah. Thankfully, I didn't listen. Uh, um, but yeah, the, but the value here is what he's getting at. The value of wise counsel to keep us in balance in the rat race. That's, that's what he's talking about. So let's go on and let's jump back to verse 7. And this is going to sound familiar again. I, I told you repetition, repetition. So how, did, how, did he, how is he going to tell us to keep balance in the rat race? Before we read it again, what would you guess? What's he told us almost every night? Enjoy your life. Enjoy your life. Enjoy your life. Be content. All right, so let's read it, 7 to 10. Go then, eat your bread in happiness, and drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be, clothes be white all the time, and let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your, life, your fleeting life, which he has given you under the sun. For this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, verily, do it with all your might. For there is no activity or planning or wisdom in Sheol where you're going. So we've, we've heard a lot of this before, right? Enjoy your life today as a gift. That's an act of, it's countercultural. Right? Everything is screaming around us. You got to get more. You got to run faster. Got to be the best, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's, there's discontent, constant discontent, right? That's what advertising is about. So, right? driving demands you want to buy more stuff or go more places or whatever it is, right? Go then, eat your bread and happiness, contentment, if you will, 
Drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. And we, we've talked about this before, about our works. Earlier in the book, he's talked several times about our lot. Enjoy your lot in life. Okay, Look over Ephesians 2.10. This lot of New Testament says this. Uh, yeah, 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God's already figured out the good works you're supposed to get done while you're in this uncertain time on the earth. God's already, already prepared them, these things. That's what the preacher's been talking about your lot in life. What has been your work to do here on, on the earth. God's prepared these things. He's already, and this says he's already approved your works. Verse 8. Let your clothes be white all the time and let not oil be lacking on your head. What's that about? Mine says wear fine clothes with a splash of cologne. <laughs> yeah. That's the New Living yeah. Translation. Yeah. But yeah. I like what, that. Did, <laughs> what did David do when uh, Bathsheba had her baby and he died? The Lord caused the baby to die. He got he got up and what did he do? What's it say he did? I didn't give you the reference. He put on clothes. He bathed and put on clothes and it says he put on lotions. Okay. Psalm 23. Uh, I gave you this. I think I gave you that reference, didn't I? Yeah. yeah. Psalm 23, 5 talks about how God has anointed my head with oil. Okay, this is the idea of being clean, taking care of yourself, dressing your dressing well, and in 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 living this life of contentment is what he's talking about here. Don't go around mourning. The other way to say it. Don't go around mourning and uh, uh, trashing yourself out. Live live in contentment. And so he's talking about let your clothes be white all the time. In Revelation, who's wearing the white clothes? Saints. Well, it's the saints. The saints are in white robes, right? So it's a, it's also talking about living holy. It's talking about living, you know, dressing yourself well, taking care of yourself. It's talking about living in holiness. Living, you, when David gets anointed, right? Samuel pours the oil over his head. The oil... Um, uh, Jesus is anointed before he goes to the cross. The oil in Scripture is always a mark of the Holy Spirit. It's always a mark of the Holy Spirit. So he's talking about let not oil be lacking on your head. He's talking about living, living in enjoyment and living holy. He's talking about verse nine. He consecrates marriage. Now think. Think again here about if this is Solomon writing this, or Solomon's persona writing this. So he says, enjoy life with the woman whom you love all the days of your fleeting night. Not all the thousands of women in your fleeting <laughs> life, right? But he's consecrating monogamy as part of a contented, a contented, worshipful life. Uh, you know, our, our culture... Uh, only about was it thirty percent of couples are married now, or within at least in the younger um, younger part of our society. Um, there's more and more of this talk about polyamory and this uh, idea that you've got multiple multiple partners. Both both the man and the woman have multiple partners simultaneously. We got shows about polygamy on TV. I never thought I'd see that. So, but he's consecrating monogamy is what he's doing here. Enjoy the life of your marriage and your one mate that God's given you. What was the picture back? Remember, he's always taking us back to Genesis 1. What's the picture back in the Garden of Eden? One man, one woman. 
monogamous marriage. Mm -hmm. That's what he's that's what he's calling out here. Um, verse ten. Uh, and I appreciate uh, Martha. You read that verse in the New Testament. Whatever your hand finds to do, verily do it with all your might. Work hard. Work hard at what God's given you to do. For there's no activity or planning and wisdom in Sheol where you're going. Um, over in 1 Corinthians 10, I think I've had you guys look at this before, but it's the same idea as the verse that uh, Martha read out of Colossians. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatever then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. All right, so if you're doing it for God's glory, you shouldn't be doing it half-hearted. Go, go full tilt. Enjoy the work that God's given you and do it well, is what he's saying. So, I, so again, he keeps pounding on this message, right? He keeps, you know, almost every week, he's bringing us back to this message. It's an act of worship to live in contentment with what God's given you, to live in contentment with the, with the work he's given you to do, to live in holiness in a culture that's trying to spin as fast as it can, and with balance. All these things, right? All these things, at least I saw it in my career, the more responsibility you got, the harder it was to do what he's talking about in verses 7 through 10. The more responsibility you have, the more demands you have on you, the less time for your family, the less time, the more, you know, well, we've got this meeting scheduled on Sunday morning because so-and-so couldn't get there. So the competition with church, even. These kinds of the demands on your family become harder and harder if, if, if in the rat race. If you do 7 to 10, that's going to, that's going to help you keep your feet on the ground and stay balanced in the rat race going on around you. That's what he's trying to tell us tonight. Yes, ma'am. Verse 9 in the uh, NIV, this, this just stuck out. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun all your meaningless days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My uh, yeah, mine says fleeting life. Yeah, but the different versions. Are, the point is, this life under the sun. He's been talking to us about now for nine chapters. If you're not living it to the glory of God, it's going to be meaningless, and it's going to be fleeting, and it's going to be without value, and it's going to be without a point. Right. Psalm 37, 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. I mean, that's basically what you're supposed to do. I mean, that's pretty simple. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord. And he shall give you the desires of your heart. And it goes on and on. I mean, you know right. this. That's one of my favorite verses. Well, okay. that's the yep. advice that was given to me that I was so wise. But we just shouldn't be fretful of all the evil that's going on. We should trust in the Lord and do good. That's a pretty good summary from what I said. Well, it's easy to say it, but not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. we shouldn't do bad. No. <laughs> right. I just, I, you know, I told you in the introduction, I, you know, Ecclesiastes is a rough book, mm -hmm. right? Because it's going on and on about the meaninglessness and the vanity and the absurdity and all this that we're swimming in, right? But I told you I was going to teach this as a call to faith. And I think, again, 7 through 10, that's a call to faith. That's calling us to live countercultural in, in everything that's going on around us, right? It's exalting marriage, it's exalting contentment. Uh, it's exalting to you know to do well, uh, uh, but keep your you know. But it's got an emphasis on family. It's talking about the uh, the you know enjoying marriage and everything. This world screaming out those things aren't worth 
you know, there's, there's bigger things to be gotten by advancement or by wealth or by fame or whatever. And God's saying, keep your feet on the ground. The preacher's saying, keep your feet on the ground. Enjoy what God's given you. And I, I submit that that's an act of worship. You know, not just walking through the door of the sanctuary, but living life out in contentment. Anything else? He's going to keep pounding on this theme. Any other comments tonight? Okay. All right. So here's your here's your your hard questions for the week. Have you doubted God's sovereignty and providence? First part of the lesson we talked about this unpredictability of God's sovereignty. God taking you through stuff where God where you've doubted whether God knew what he was doing. I think we all have. Why me? Yeah. Why now? Right? And those are usually the wrong questions to ask. Right? Um, yeah, we talked about wise counsel. Who do you look to as wise counselors that you can go to and have, get that word of wisdom and find it and apply it? Do you have people that you think that you would trust to be wise counselors? I have a very good friend that I can call anytime. Anytime I want to share all this giving wisdom and not make any comment until the very end when I make, I make my own decision. I just ask the Lord, Lord, what are you trying to show me? What are you trying to tell me? Okay. okay. You know, could you sit in the angel that you sit with that rubber ball band, could you? <laughs> Send him back. <laughs> off a little bit. Yeah. We're like, like Mary is getting at. Do you have people that you can call, you can pray with, you can talk to? Those those are invaluable people to help keep your feet on the ground. All right. Um, so you know, I, I just say check this week. You know, ask God. You know, are you living in, in pleasure or you? you know, Pastor just did his little sermonette. He was talking about rejoicing in the Lord, finding your joy in the Lord. Ask the Lord this week, you know, I, am I living the way you want me to be living in contentment? The Holy Spirit's pretty good about showing us where there's a problem or a gap, right? But ask the Lord this week in your prayer line, are there, are there gaps here? Are there places where I'm discontent with you? Or, or my or attitude's wrong about how or this life that you've given me to live. Um, I just, I just uh, I'm asking you, to, you know, let that be part of your prayer life this week, is what, what my thought is. Anything else you think you ought to do based on this word? You know, God predestined what we were going to be. I mean, our life. He knows already. I mean, from beginning to end, when he created us. To me, that blows my mind of how many people. But the, that's the, my little finite mind. Predestined and yet given us free choice. That's right. Mm -hmm. But he knows that end. He knows exactly how I'm going to choose. What I'm going to choose and how I'm going to do what he has given me to do to you. He's given each one of us. The mystery of his providence. Yep. Yep. All right. So next week, um, we're going to talk about life with uncertainty. And uh, so we'll be reading Ecclesiastes 10. And there's a lot of great Proverbs in there. And uh, so, uh, but I just invite you, you know, Pray this week and just ask God, you know, show me if there's part of this life of contentment that I'm not living out like you'd have to. So, anything else tonight before we close? It's a great reminder. Some people are just complainers. So it's a great perspective to put in there. Yep. Woe is me. <laughs>
<laughs> yep. Gracious Lord, we give praise to you tonight. And thank you for your wise word. Thank you, Lord, for how you give us caution and, and warn us, Lord, about traps in this life. Give us grace, Lord, this week to live holy and to live in contentment and to live with balance in this very unbalanced, off-balance world. We give you thanks, Lord, for this counsel from your word tonight. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.